Good afternoon, everyone. So I am going to present Europe core data to complement the INSPI framework. What is in addition in UNGGIM compared to INSPI? I think it's a question that many of you may have in mind. So first, some core data context and objective, the general overview. The context is that we have already INSPI. And the main objective of INSPI, I'm taking about interoper <coughs> talking only about interoperability, is to harmonize existing data. So it's really supplying a very precious first level of interoperability. We have common data model, we have common reference system, and it's already a very great thing. However, it's not solving all the issues. Uh, because inspired data will remain heterogeneous uh, for many reasons. There are no requirements about level of detail. For instance, for themes such as hydro or transport network, there may be existing data, but at very heterogeneous level of detail. And there is absolutely no obligation in inspired about which level of detail should be provided. And most concepts avoidable. If you have them, you should provide them for inspired. But if you don't have, there is no obligation for new data capture. So, what are the objectives of the working group on European core data? We have to specify homogeneous core data that has to be supplied by geographic Europe member states. And in practice, it means our work is about defining priorities for the production of, for, and, and for production of new data, for uh, improvement of existing data. So our specification, uh, they may be used, I will say, in two ways. Uh, they may be recommendations for politicians uh, to plan their future uh, work about uh, data, about geographic information. But uh, for those who are more enthusiastic, more involved, we can also imagine some commitment for production uh, between different countries to go closer to a European product. So, in other words, what are our objectives? Uh, maybe you have already seen this pyramid. It was designed in the health project. The first level of, of uh, harmonization is the conformity to INSPI, having common data model, common uh, coordinate reference system. Uh, then it's to have core content, uh, a minimum set of feature types and attributes that are effectively produced and that are not just empty boxes and then having homogeneous level of detail. So for UNGGIM, our target is to get three-star three data. So we will select the core content from INSPI, and for this core content, include quality criteria, data capture rules to ensure homogeneous data. If I make this comparison with INSPI, uh, there are different drivers. Uh, the driver of INSPI is the European Commission in practice, the, the environment, the ERC, Eurostat, uh, European uh, Environmental Agency. Uh, for UNGGIM, it's the United Nations. The geographic scope is also different. INSPI is about the political Europe, the uh, 28 and soon 27 member states. And uh, for UNGGIM, it's geographic Europe. The objective of INSPI is to harmonize existing data. And for UNGGIM is to get harmonized data, uh, but by all the means, maybe just by harmonizing what exists, but also by capturing new data, by improving existing data. The status INSPI is a European directive. There is legal obligation for the member state. Uh, for UNGGIM, it's just a recommendation. There is no legal obligation. It's an encouragement to, to member states. We just have, I will say, the political weight of the uh, of United States. Another comparison with INSPI that may told to you maybe more, we can see INSPI as a big cheese with a lot of holes. And of course, some users begin to complain because they have not so much to eat in INSPI. All these empty box, all these voidable elements that are rarely filled. 
So the idea of UNGGIM is to have the same kind of cheese, but more compact, smaller, but really with matter in it, with no more holes. <coughs> the organization and calendar of UNGGIM Working Group A, uh, we have representatives from 15 European countries that are listed here. We have also observers uh, from the European Commission, GRC, uh, European Environmental <coughs> Agency, and we have also EuroSDR. That is uh, the link between research and NMCA. The calendar, we had to make a selection of core theme. Uh, we did this by beginning of this year in January, and we have to make the core data specification by end of next, uh, next year. The calendar is very tight. So the first step, it was about the selection of core data theme before specifying in detail all the theme, we first have to decide among the 34 themes of INSPIRE, not all can be core. We cannot put priority of everything. <coughs> so the approach was to try to find the user requirements and to select as core data themes those that are the most widely required. And our universe of discourse was the sustainable development goals. You have here the 17 uh, develop, uh, sustainable development goals accepted by the United Nations, and most of them consume geographic information. These goals are divided into targets, and the first step was to identify the targets consuming geographic information. I will give an example. I think that the goal seven is about energy, and we have a target about accessible energy, we have a target about efficient energy, we have a target about renewable energy, and all these three targets are consuming geographic information. And we have tried to identify the actions that, that will enable to reach these targets. It's not just about analyzing or reporting, it's really about achieving the sustainable development goals. And for each of these actions, trying to find what, what are the required data. And we have tried to make some summary by use case maps for each theme. So this use case map looks like this. Uh, it's for elevation. Uh, what is in yellow, it's the indirect use. Sometimes a data theme is not used directly to reach the sustainable development goal, but for instance, to develop other products. Typically, elevation is required to make or to image, as all of you know perfectly. The other point has uh, these uh, several uh, levels, these several steps in the decision. We have the analysis, but when we have the analysis, we should make decision, practical decision. For instance, find the best place for a new infrastructure, for wind farm, and we need elevation. Uh, geographic information, it's not just for analysis, it's also to find practical solution. It's also for communication, for instance, for mapping, and it's also for monitoring, for reporting to environmental directive, to the SDG, uh, to give permission, all this kind, monitoring that the decisions that are taken are really applied. So we had, Uh, based on this use case map, long discussion uh, within the working group A, and I think that this histogram showed how difficult the decision is, because one of the conclusions is that there is no uh, clear gap between data that is widely used and data that is poorly used. Of course, all the inspired data is useful, some more useful than others, but it's really difficult to know where to put the, the selection uh, line. So at the end, we decided that the selection line should be here. And to get an idea maybe more easy to read, here is the final list of the core data themes. So we have geographical names, administrative units, addresses, cadastral parcels, transport networks, hydrography, elevation, land cover, ortho-imagery. We have also statistical units, buildings, 
land use, utility and governmental services, and area management restriction regulation. So at the end, we have 14 themes. And I will say almost 15, because we consider that protected sites as a specific uh, case of area management. There are also some regulated areas. So INSPI has helped us quite a lot to make this work because INSPI is offering us a common terminology. The themes, they are defined. So when we talk about theme, we know what we, we are talking about. So it's really a common, uh, a wonderful common understanding within the working group and also for communication. When I am talking about the theme we have selected, all of you understand what it is about. Uh, we have also reused quite a lot the use case. Uh, however, the scope was not exactly the same. Uh, INSPI is really focused on environment, environmental policies, policies having impact on environment. Whereas the Sustainable Development Goals, of course there is environment, but there is also the economy, the society, uh, the social aspect. And another more technical uh, point is that the use case, they are described in the data specification in Annex B in general, but with heterogeneous quality. For instance, for Annex 1, it was not mandatory to have this uh, Annex B in the data specification, and sometimes the description is not as good as for Annex 2 and Annex 3. So we have really used a lot this description of use case, but we had to complement them, for instance, with other bibliography and with expert interviews. Some other learnings is that data required at various levels of detail. We need data at global and regional, for the, mainly for analyzing, monitoring, reporting. But when we want to make concrete things and to make progress in the sustainable goal, uh, development goals achievement, we need local data uh, to achieve these goals. And we need also topographic and administrative data sets. Generally, the topographic data is directly useful uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. For instance, you can think about transport or land cover, uh, there is direct use. But the administrative it's data it has a powerful uh, role because we can link with other data. Think about statistical units that may li be linked to a lot of statistical data about uh, population, economy, health statistics, and things like this. Think about address that allow us to uh, the geocoding of almost any file having address, geographical name, and these kind of things. And we are thinking for this core data uh, about some kind of pyramid with core data at national level that might be maybe wider at the regional core level, at European level, and maybe uh, still uh, smaller at the global level. So the second step is about core data specifications. <coughs> it's ongoing work. It's even a beginning work. So our calendar is we have three themes to be specified be uh, before end of this year. Uh, the candidates are cadastral parcels, geographical names, and addresses or administrative unit. At the beginning, we thought about administrative unit that al always look very simple, but when you dig a little more, it's always more complex than you imagine at the beginning. And all the themes will have to be specified before the end of this year. So our principles, we use INSPI specification as starting point, and we try to define priorities to extract the core data. For instance, for data model, try to find what has the most useful feature type, what has the most useful uh, attributes. But sometimes we have also to clarify the scope. For instance, some seem are very generic, such as statistical unit or area management, and maybe we have to define the priorities more in the scope than in the model. And we have also to decide about which level of details are the most relevant, are the most required, uh, what are the main quality uh, criteria, the main quality rules required by users. Some example of discussion to give you an idea what we are doing or trying to do. For instance, we had first, first discussion about theme transport. So in INSPI, we have road, railway, 
air, cable, and water transport, and we thought that maybe all these things are quite useful, but maybe road, railway, and airports are more useful than the, uh, for instance, the air routes or the water routes that are more maybe uh, business data used by a sm smaller number of stakeholders. And one of the conclusions is that probably we need large-scale data regarding transport uh, to have a useful application. I am thinking about extracting things from Inspire, but in some other cases, maybe Inspire is not enough and we have to add things to Inspire. For instance, we have this discussion in the group about having true addresses. Uh, to have, I will say, street name and house number everywhere, even in rural areas. But in this way, we are even going further than data capture. We are, in a way, changing the real world, or at least trying to change it. But I really think that good addresses everywhere would help quite a lot, lots of users. So it's under discussion, and if you have ideas about it, you can contact us. We, we are open to, to exchange with, uh, with the world, at least with Europe. So I am at the end of my presentation. So if you want to know more, if you want to know more about the past, it's very easy. Uh, we have uh, delivered our first deliverable. It's on the UNGGIM uh, website, so uh, you can just uh, go and uh, there is the first deliverable that is uh, available there with some uh, additional document. And if you want to know about, about the future, uh, maybe the next year in SPY conference, if there is still a UNGGIM UNGGIM session, and I think there will be other communication events such as the European Forum for Geography and Statistics in November in Paris, uh, maybe the Cisco UNGGIM meeting in Luxembourg. Uh, there will be other communication about the work we are going in uh, about core data specification. So, thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dominique, for your schema of the geospatial reference information, geospatial reference data at the European level. Thank you. Next presentation is the, the title is Addressing System and Sustainable Development by Bruce McCormack, the Geo Directory Ireland. Sorry, I'm not sure where it is. I can see the technical guy coming along. Um, so while he's coming, I'd just like to say, um, in the program it says Bruce McCormack, Geodirectory Island. I'm not an employee of Geodirectory. Um, I don't work for them, but they're paying my costs to be here. So I do need to say something nice about Geodirectory. But what I say, is not just because they're paying my costs to be here. Sorry, is it this one? Just, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just because they're paying my costs, it's because I actually really believe that Geodirectory is a good practice example of an, how you can organize, run, maintain, etc., an addressing database. I really do mean that, and I'm saying that because I've used GeoDirectory over the last 10 years or something um, as a town and regional planner, which is my basic job, um, and I found it extremely useful. So um, <clears throat> I found what I liked about GeoDirectory was a few things. The first one is updated quarterly. The second one is the 2.2 million address points in Ireland are georeferenced to within about <coughs> two meters of the center point of every one of them and they hang a whole lot of other data to those address points. Um, I, just to give you an example of the hanging of the data, they've got an app where you can stand in the street in Dublin or wherever else in Ireland, you point your phone around like this. If there's a building there which has been sold within the last few years, what you see on your screen is the selling price of that building. In other words, um, augmented reality starts becoming linked back to the addressing database. 
So that's a kind of a little bit of a <laughs> advertising. Um, but what I did is I asked the CEO, Dara Keo, he's sitting down there and I hope he comes up in a moment. I asked him to actually be co-presenter for this particular presentation. So Dara, um, I'll say a few words in the beginning and then you can take over and I'll come back. Um, what is an address and why is it important? Uh, addressing prerequisites, structure of addressing, the SDGs, um, SDG indicator hooks for addressing, <coughs> I'll come to this just now, inspire and the SDGs, some possible opportunity areas. So that's the basic structure that we'll go through. But I'd like to at this point hand over to Dara and I'll come back after he's had a few words. So this guy's the CEO of GeoDirectly. Dara? Thank you very much, Bruce. You should be working for us, really. <laughs> Great advertising to us. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, well, Bruce has already introduced me. We, we, we concentrate on addressing in Ireland for, and uh, we're basically the source of addressing in Ireland. So I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about addressing and I noticed in the last two presentations it was one of the key teams and, and, and I would have expected to see it so, as such in the Inspire uh, framework. And, but I'm just going to step back a little bit and imagine that I'm explaining addressing to somebody from a different universe. Okay? And so I'd have to explain to them that we live in their universe, there are many, many universes, but this is our one, that we live in a solar system. Within our system, the stellar systems, we're, we're the only solar system, apparently. We live on Earth. In, we're currently in Spain. We're in the city of Barcelona in this complex and in this room. Okay? Now, for him or her or them or it to understand me, we have to have a whole lot of stuff going on for it to work. Okay? So we have to have an agreed structure of how an address should be presented. Now, while, te while in some technical addresses it's, it's, it's been developed through in rooms like this, for most people, for addressing for a building, it's kind of true usage. And people have become to know it and learn it, and it's just developed over time. But there has to be a standardized structure even within that for, for all of you to get what I've just done on, on, on addressing to the universe, to the planet, to the, to the, to the building, to the podium here. Um, and then within the address, there's common, there's common usage of numbers, letters, and both. Now, addresses doesn't really work with numbers on its own. Fine for computers, not good for humans. We don't like them. We like things we're used to. We like words. We'll accept numbers, but we really want words. So for that structure then to actually work and to, be, to take the bite, it needs to be very widely accepted and adopted. And has to be used by essentially by everybody for it to work. Otherwise, you have you have this situation, which was in Ireland, where there was loads of different types of addressing. Now, I'm only talking 15 years ago. There was loads of different types of addressing and different models, and now there's only one. Okay, <coughs> so we went from this spread of of uh, approaches to a single approach that is accepted by everybody and adopted by everybody. It, it has to be an address structure to work. Has to move from the general to a specific point. It has to have a rooting aspect. It has to lead you somewhere. It has to get you there. It has to have su sufficient capacity to grow over time. So if you have a building here and have a building here, you have to have another building, etc. And you have to allow for infill between buildings. Now, an example of an addressing structure that wasn't great and a very modern address stru addressing structure that is for the internet. So internet addressing is built on a thing called IPv4. They ran out of addresses. You would think all the technical people behind that, that would never happen. So they had to create IBV, IBV6, which has billions of addresses. But now if you have an IPv6 address, it's wrapped in a bundle, put into an IPv, IPv4 address, and sent on its way across the internet. Okay? So that's an example of an addressing structure that was only very recently in human t sort of time created, and yet from, by very technical people, but they forgot they had to create it, it's sort of a very, very large capacity. And in today's world, we need it to be digital. We need that address to be able to be used in a digital way. So we go back to our example, and we see we move from the universe to our solar system. So we're getting more and more specific as we move through to Spain. Our holder here is the country of Spain. We're in the city of Barcelona. We're in this, this complex. And then we're in a seat here, or a room here. And so this address within this complex, you can have many rooms. And they all have a different name, so therefore they're all unique. So it'll work. It'll work as an addressing structure. 
Now, I'm going to hand over now to Bruce, but just to say that the thing about the address is, is, is that it's, it's at the root of big data, uh, Internet of Things, link data, all that kind of stuff. It all, if they, if it works really well if you have one piece of data that everything can hang from, that everybody trusts and everybody knows. And if that's an address, which we're seeing more and more use of, it'll, it'll grow. And the same for Inspire. If it has a single piece that's publicly known, it's, it's great everybody in here knows stuff, but we want people on the street to know it and to be behind it for it to really to push it through and grow it and get people behind it. And everybody knows their address. If they can trust in that, believe in that, and build on that, it's, it's, it's going to be easier to have success. It takes, it takes time, these things, but it does lead to success. I'm going to hand over to, to Bruce now. Thanks, Dara. Um, what is an address? Why is it important? A standardized, unique identifier for a unique entity. You know, I mean, this is really high-level generalist kind of stuff. The entity may be physical. It could be the galaxy, the universe. A subatomic particle um, can have an address. Um, or it could be a house. So addressing seen in a very generic way is... Um, got all sorts of dimensions. That's all, that's all addresses describing a physical thing. However, it could be virtual. Um, my email address, your email address, a website, um, whatever. Why is it addressing important, seen in this kind of, a kind of conceptual kind of way? It enables things, whether they're objects, people, information, to be moved or rooted from anywhere to there, that particular point, to seat number six in this room. Um, if you want. It enables things to be tracked while they're moving around. Um, it provides a place or a location in which you can find things. Um, and it provides a basis on which to hang other information or to link other information to it. I gave the example just now of the hanging of some uh, property value information to an address point, you know, the mobile phone app that these guys have got. Um, that's just one example of the last one. Um, and when you start thinking about it, addressing is absolutely fundamental to the way our whole society works. Um, if you think of addressing in this way, it really is. We couldn't function as a society as we do if we didn't have these addressing systems as defined at the top there. SDGs. Now, I mean, you've heard about the SDGs. Um, they have a kind of root, to some extent, in a report in 2012, um, UN document, um, The Future We Want. We recognise the poverty, eradication, changing unsustainable and promoting sustainable patterns of consumption and production, and protecting and managing the natural resource base of economic and social development are the overarching objectives of and essential requirements for sustainable development. Um, so what's come out eventually um, is the SDGs, as we know of them, 17 goals, 69 targets, 230 indicators. I think maybe there's somebody here who knows a bit more than I do, which is probably not too difficult, but about the indicators, because I think it's a little bit of a moving feast. Um, 230 is the currently approved, but subject to further discussion. Came into effect in the 1st of January this year. The final comment there, SDGs represent a very important globally accepted framework, accepted by 193 countries, for shaping development policies and programs, practices and so on over the period up to 2030. This is not some kind of little minor eddy or current out there. This is the big current that we need to um, draw, you know, have our attention focused on. SDG indicators. Now, if you start looking at the SDG, particularly the indicators at that level, um, the concept that I've put here is hooks. Where amongst those indicators are the kind of hooks, the thing that you could hang addressing onto to be able to monitor um, what's going on in terms of progress in all those 193 countries? And I've just listed a few here. The obvious places for hooks, bearing in mind what addressing is and does, the normal sense of addressing, you know, like for a house or a business or something, um, the hooks you would immediately look for would be, for example, households, 
Is there a reference somewhere in all there to some information about households and what's going on? Because that's an obvious place where addressing can link up. Yes, obviously there are, and I list some here. I won't read them all out. Is there a business hook? Yes. Um, is there a kind of community hook? Yes. Proportion of schools with access to electricity, internet for pedagogical purposes, etc., etc. So I'm not planning to go into any detail here, but the concept <coughs> is looking through all the SDGs and looking for those hooks to which you can quite simplistically anyway, obviously, hang addressing information and data. And my view is they're certainly there, and I've given some examples here. Inspire and the SDGs. Um, I mean, so I think everybody knows about Inspire here. Yeah, Inspire Annex 1 data theme focuses on the physical buildings, property, that sort of bundle, not addressing in the big, big picture conceptual way that I'd originally set out. It focuses down on a small component of the big addressing picture, um, but nevertheless an extremely important component, and it's that component that these guys, Geodirectory, are focused particularly on. So SGGs, I think, represents a major stage for Inspire. So you've got Inspire over there, you've got all the stuff in the address guidelines and all this stuff, and you've got SDGs. I think there's a big opportunity for taking Inspire and looking back, mapping it onto the, with some adaptions, mapping it onto the SDGs. Key challenge, identifying opportunities in the SDG framework for value adding by Inspire generally, and then addressing in particular. Now, this is some kind of speculation and thought going into the future. Um, some possible opportunities for this mapping across that I was talking about, and I've listed them as levels one, two, and the next slide is three and four. To some extent, they get more and more complex as, as you go up the level. The first level would be the most basic one, and just doing what I showed you a little bit of is looking at the SDGs and looking for the hooks where one could hook what has been done and inspire around addressing into those SDG framework. So explore the SDGs in some detail to identify opportunities for the inspire addressing approach to hook onto particular targets and or indicators. Probably indicators is really the focus because targets start getting a little bit fluffy and high level. Um, and the goals are actually even more fluffy and high level. But um, be that as it may, I think the level us kind of people would think about would be the indicator level. Um, the <clears throat> so that's the one thing. It's just take addresses and map it across into the SDGs. That's a job. It takes time and it'll take a bit of effort. The second level would be <clears throat> to explore the SDGs to identify opportunities for an inspire address based package. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is of course addressing doesn't exist by itself. It's certainly not inspire, there's all those data themes and all the rest of it. Um, maybe one could look and say, instead of just trying to look map across addressing to the SDGs, you could take a little package of, um, of the, the kind of data themes that are dealt with in inspire you could look in a more packaged way across between the two. Now, what exactly you would put in that package, I mean, I've just suggested here buildings, land cover, I don't know, but that could be given some thought. But as an approach, that's something somebody could do. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the th third level um, would be the same as level two, or maybe even level one, but actually start thinking about introducing Internet of Things, um, where sensors, activators, which will have an address, a, a geographic address apart from anything else, um, start thinking beyond what's sitting in Inspire here, but sitting thinking about some other things to link back with Inspire, including addressing, back onto the SDGs. So that would be a third line of inquiry, as it were. And the fourth line, and the final one, and I'm nearing the end, um, the fourth one and the final one here is to promote the development of what I've called a physical object-based 
geo geodatabases um, and put it into a linked data format. Okay, what, what's going on in Ireland is the National Mapping Agency um, has what I've called here physical object linked based geodatabase. Um, what they're doing is they've got, when I last heard, which is a little while ago, um, they've got 50 million physical geographic objects, and each object has its own ID and will have its own web address. Okay? So an object could be a lamppost outside in the street. It could be a, I don't know, a stretch of pavement, whatever it is. It could be a building, it, and so on and so on. So each of these 50 million, and it gets going up, each of these 50 million is, has got a unique ID and a web address. And then what they're doing um, is they're putting all of this into a linked data format. Don't have the time to talk about what that really means, but they're putting it into a linked data format. And what the suggestion here is, as another way of looking at this mapping between what Inspire has done and what the SDGs are about, is thinking it of it in the context of this approach, which is not theoretical, it's happening in Ireland. Okay? So an addressing would be a component in this, this approach. So what I've done um, is basically look at some directions that we could move in, we, the collective us, we, the directions that we could move in in thinking about Inspire in relation to the SDGs. It's high-level stuff, but it gives a, a direction, I think. And finally, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to us, from me, from Dara sitting here, and the other person behind all this is a guy called Pierre Rousseau, who's based in Johannesburg. He is a consultant for the um, Universal Postal Union, doing a lot, writing their manuals of all sorts of things. So. These are the guys behind what you've just heard. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next next speaker is the is Mr. Glenn Van Kaubenherge. Complicated. And the title is The Governance and Performance of Open Spatial Data Policies in the Context of Inspire, Understanding the Needs for Alignment. Uh, good afternoon. So my name is Glenn van Kaumberg, and I'm working as a researcher at the University of Delft. <coughs> Together with my colleague, uh, Bastian van Loonen, I'm currently involved in a project on the governance and the performance of open spatial data uh, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, today I would like to present some of the very first findings and results and ideas we have uh, in the context of this project. We just started, so they are very preliminary. So the presentation will not be about UN GGIM, but I believe, or I hope, that some of the findings we have uh, are relevant to the work of UN GGIM, and in particular in their uh, identification of best practices and in their exploration on how different countries worldwide are dealing with the institutional and policy and legal aspects of uh, <coughs> geographic information. I would like to start my presentation with uh, uh, going back to stu two studies on SDIs spatial data infrastructure we have done in the past. The first one was an analysis of the SDI in Flanders, Belgium, that we've done uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, in 2008. So what you here see is an analysis or is a visualization of the SDI network in Flanders. It's visualized, what you see are, here are data flows between data producers and data users in Flanders. Uh, we've structured different organizations according to their administrative level. Uh, however, the flows of data are crossing through those levels, so the hierarchical structure is there in, uh, with regard to the administrative structure, but uh, we rather see a more network based of working, of sharing information uh, for what concerns yeah, how to deal with uh, geographic information. Based on this information, so they, they, so at that time, those were real flows of data that were happening to producers and users uh, all, all within the public sector. We were able to identify four main SDI arrangements at that time. You see in the central of the picture, it's the ARIF. Uh, those were, uh, the, I should have said, the, the central data distribution hip of, uh, hub of the SDI Flanders partnership. That's the main uh, SDI uh, arrangement in Flanders. 
But besides that, you also have the FPS finance, that is uh, mainly for cadastral and related data. At that time, also the provinces, the lowest level, uh, were very active in distributing uh, data, uh, especially to the municipalities uh, within their region. And finally, we identified a group of the remaining ones. And now what we've done afterwards was in fact to compare uh, those four types of arrangements and to have a look at yeah, what are now the key differences between uh, uh, these uh, arrangements, how are they dealing with certain barriers. And we had a look at five types of barriers or five characteristics of flows at that time. We had a look at the price, the legal base, the transfer method, the need for preparations and the use restrictions. I think what you have to remember from this uh, picture that was at that time there were quite important, quite significant differences related to these five key characteristics uh, of data flows, of data sharing relationships uh, with regard to the different data providers, but also depending on who was the users. So it was not harmonized at all. There were some, uh, still some quite important barriers that may change that those users within the public sector that wanted to use a certain data set had some problems. They had to pay a quite significant amount. Uh, they had to uh, do a lot of preparations for before they could actually use them. Uh, there were some uh, very important use restrictions, so they could not do uh, what would, uh, whatever they would like to do. You see that there were uh, important differences if we compare the four types. That was the first study that was relevant to our ongoing work. Another one is the uh, smith Pyre study. Uh, it's a uh, part of an FP7 uh, project, a European project, in which we had a look at how private uh, companies and an SMEs in particular were involved or were uh, actively participating in the implementation of SDIs and then uh, Inspire in general. Uh, it was an interesting project. One of the things we've done was not only research, but we also did some research. We did a study. Uh, we organized a survey. And more interesting, we also talked with a lot of key stakeholders, people from the private sector, on how they were at that time were already involved in SDI, Inspire or not, but also on whether what they expected in the future on how uh, Inspire could provide uh, benefits to them or could have a real impact on their work. I think what we at that time, uh, the, the key result was that a lot of them had quite big, quite uh, important uh, expectations of Inspire. And their main expectation that was in the future, hopefully for them in the near future, they could have access to quite a lot of data, quite a lot of valuable data, uh, services in a very smooth way, so without restrictions, without having to pay too much, so that they could uh, develop new services uh, and provide new products on top of the Inspire uh, data and services. So they expected that, so they hoped that would be, uh, become a reality as soon as possible. But at the time, it was not the case at all. So the current access and use conditions at that time, they were not harmonized at all. In many cases, it was not clear. And in many cases, they were not open to them. So public sector, uh, private companies and other uh, parties outside the public sector could not uh, take advantage of the uh, large amount of, amount of inspired data and services. Now, if we now have a look a few years afterwards and what has happened uh, in recent years, I think we should say that uh, quite a lot has happened. And if we uh, compare with the network, or if we use the SDI network as a term, I think we see two main uh, developments or two main trends. On one hand, we see that the uh, SDI network has improved, has been optimized uh, in two ways. In our opinion, on one hand, there was a, a clear allocation of tasks and activities. So duplications, in some cases also contradictions between organizations, they were removed uh, by saying you are now responsible for doing this for this data set and you are responsible for that. So clear allocation of tasks, that's an important uh, evolution. Otherwise, it was removing the different types of barriers that we explored, more and more towards harmonizing the data flow characteristics, so I'm making sure that the access to and the exchange of spatial data uh, within the public sector become more and more smooth. Also important in the context of this uh, event, we saw that uh, more and more happened towards enlarging the net SDI network. More and more links were made uh, because of Inspire to the European Commission, but also to users uh, in other member states. That was one evolution. Other evolution we saw is, in fact, opening the SDI network, again, enlarging by uh, involving private sector research institutions, citizens, 
considering them as a, as a node, but also as an, e an equal node, an important node of the network. So they could also take advantage of what was done before by, in creating the SDI network. So they, the, net, the metadata were there, the services are there, the data become uh, harmonized. So also the users outside the public sector could take advantage of them. They uh, get uh, access to all the data, and they were also uh, involved in the governance of the network. That's, uh, I think that's the main evolutions we saw that happened in the recent years. If we now have a look or we focus on the issue of uh, governance, we try to look on what is done with regard to governance to make that SEI more open, so to also involve uh, the, uh, public, uh, the private companies, non-government organizations, research institutions, citizens, as much as possible in the governments. We see that also different member states become more and more active in using different uh, governance instruments uh, to make their SGI more open. This is in fact a very brief summary of uh, uh, what we see that has happened in different member states, although at a different timing or at a different extent. But you see here in fact what we see, what we call uh, SDI or Inspire governance instruments. So they can be used to govern your SDI or Inspire implementation. But you see more and more these instruments have been uh, revised, adapted, modified to make sure that also private companies, uh, non-profit uh, organizations, citizens, etc., are also involved. So just an example of these, uh, all of them are applied. So you see reshuffling of competences, more and more tasks are given to private companies. The legal framework has been adapted, the regulated market now also focused on the external market, etc., etc. So this is in fact some first uh, overview of what we've uh, seen that has happened in recent years in Europe in different member states, although at a different, I should say, timing. So you see some uh, evolution. Now the challenge, something I also mentioned in my presentation yesterday, is about uh, the governance of those two worlds. You see a lot of that happens with regard to governance of open data. We in this room are mainly uh, involved in the governance of spatial data. I think now the key challenge is to bring those two worlds together and to in fact have some meta governance of those two worlds. That's a challenge. Uh, then the other side of uh, our research is focusing on the performance. We call it open spatial data performance. It's in fact an extension of what we before called SDI uh, performance. It's in fact about yeah, how we do, what are we doing, how those things that we are doing, are we doing them well? The information, the infrastructure we are developing, is he uh, performing well? Is the infrastructure in this country X better than the infrastructure in another country? How do we know it? Should, what should we take into account? How can we compare it? So that's what we call the issue of performance. It's about is an infrastructure uh, performing well, uh, yes or no? I think we should be uh, honest about it. A lot of people in this room, a lot of researchers, a lot of practitioners have been dealing with these questions for many years. I think since the beginning of this century, you have articles, you have very valuable uh, experiences of member states, of governments in thinking about and in fact dealing with this question. You see now more recently, only since 2008, also the open data community starts to think about this issue and try to in fact develop uh, practices, ideas on how to deal with that. Again here, two worlds, they are doing in fact the same, they're using uh, different terms, and here you see, again see a quite uh, important need for alignment. So different practices in both communities, uh, they are strongly thinking about the same things, but they're not always looking at each other and taking into, a, uh, into account each other's wor uh, work. What I want to express with this picture, yeah, it's all about the same if you now talk about public sector performance, e-government performance, uh, SDI performance or SDI assessment, or we're talking about assessment of open data or of SDIs. In fact, it's all about the same. You have an input, you are doing something to create an output, to make data available. You hope in the end that these data are used and the, the final uh, objective is that you have some benefits, socioeconomic benefits, not only for the public sector, but also for other uh, characteristics. So what we aim to express uh, in our thinking, but also with this picture, is that yeah, it's all the same input, output, outcomes, impact. You're not saying that uh, only it's not only relevant for our work, but it's in fact a general view on how to deal with performance or how to deal with assessment. Now in our context, you can operationalize it in this way. So you have readiness, availability, use, and benefits. It's a quite clear structure that we use to organize our think thinking, but also our practices with regard to open spatial data or SDIs. 
or inspire. So you have development being or what we can do is developing different kinds of components, technical uh, components, a lot of experts here that are dealing with the technological <coughs> challenges of uh, building SDIs, but on the other hand, you also have a lot of non-technological <coughs> policy governance related components. So readiness is about all or each of these components in place, yes or no. Second part is about why are we doing this? We are doing this because we want to make as much as possible data and services uh, available and accessible. And in the end, we hope that these data are become used. So use, third pillar, third component of our assessment logic, our assessment framework, use is about are all the data that are now available are all the services that are now uh, made available by the uh, different member states, are they used by themselves, by public administrations, but also are they used by citizens, businesses, and all other types of users? And in the end, the benefits issue is about, yeah, are we now realizing uh, real socioeconomic uh, benefits of, by using those data? Does it really help us to achieve uh, benefits to realize uh, uh, gains in costs, time, etc.? I think if you would have a look at the program or if you have attended a lot of the conferences, I think you should also see this kind of logic throughout the content of the conference, presentations, also the plenary sessions. In the beginning, a lot of focus on the readiness. I think if you have now a look or if you uh, look back at what was said uh, here in Barcelona the past days, I see in a lot of presentations, a lot of countries they were talking about or they immediately used the numbers uh, about the availability of data and services, so more and more are uh, organizations are, or uh, presenters are using that information to uh, provide an overview of the status in their country or throughout Europe. So availability is, touch, is becoming more and more common. Uh, use in the past days, I saw very uh, much and a lot of uh, interesting uh, presentations of real use cases of how inspired data, inspired components have been used in different thematic areas to do nice things. And then benefits, I think, Almost every day there is at least one uh, session that is dealing uh, with this issue more and more. So I think, and I personally find it very interesting that you see more and more also the uh, final parts of uh, this framework uh, are being addressed in the conference. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the Inspire monitoring and reporting, and one, a reporting uh, process. And why I'm doing is also, why I'm a fan of that is because also there you clearly see this logic. So they try to uh, tackle each of these issues, and they also try to uh, tackle uh, the link between each of these issues. Uh, maybe to uh, provide information, it's uh, less easy or less interesting, but for me as an outsider, also when I'm dealing with uh, my students and I want them to show what an SDI is all about, what Inspire is all about, I, uh, I ask them to have a look at the monitoring reporting information, because it really helps them to understand different parts of uh, the framework and how everything is linked to each other and why in the end yeah, we are uh, doing all those efforts in implementing SDIs or implementing Inspire. So you will see those of you that are familiar uh, in the report, it's uh, they ask you, uh, member states to provide a lot of information on the readiness, role responsibilities, coordination structures, etc. Who is involved, is there a policy, strategy, uh, what are the arrangements uh, uh, that are in place, so a lot of information, a lot of Parts of the reports are dealing with the issue of readiness, availability, yeah, that's mainly uh, in, the, in the sheets, the monitoring sheets that provide an overview of the inspired data and services of each member state, including all the related information, uh, use. We also, member states are also used to report on, in, or to monitor on one hand, the use of their network services, but in the reports they should provide uh, different types of use, not only by themselves, uh, as public authorities, but also examples of the use by citizens, cross-border use. So it's uh, they uh, invite member states to think about the issue of use. If you look at the reports, you see that it's still difficult to provide uh, interesting use cases. But I think it's important to also include uh, this information uh, in the assessment and in the reporting. So in the end, these are the uh, interesting uh, examples. And also benefits, I think they also in the reporting uh, they ask the member states to provide some examples of benefits and, if possible, also the quantitative measures. Also here, this is maybe becoming uh, maybe the most difficult part for member states to really provide uh, valuable information, and especially the quantitative information they ask to. But again, I think it's uh, valuable to at least start to think about it and start collecting the information about this, if possible. 
So you have the Inspire Monitor on Reporting. What I also like is that several member states are trying to build further on this Inspire Monitoring and Reporting. I just include here one example, a very simple example. I think it's not that uh, much additional information, but uh, for me as a citizen, as a researcher, it's a quite interesting uh, kind of information. It's about the monitoring of the accessibility of spatial data in Flanders. It's about the, uh, how public administration is dealing with that issue. Uh, and they are in fact, they start from the Inspire monitoring reporting. They just use the same information that has to be reported there. But is the information or are the data discoverable, viewable, and downloadable? It's the same that you all have to report uh, with Inspire. But they include some uh, additional columns. Some incl is they include some additional uh, indicators, you can call them. They also include, is the, is the data set already accessible to the public? Is it reusable for the public? Uh, should the citizens' businesses uh, provide, uh, pay a fee to have access and to reuse the data? And under which of the standard li licenses that are in place in Flanders they can have access? So just some uh, very simple four additional indicators uh, that are mainly focusing on the accessibility of the data for the general public in addition to those indicators that have to be reported on for Inspire. And all the information is updated every a uh, few months, and it's online available. So also as a citizen, as you can uh, uh, follow the progress related to this. And my final slide... Excuse me, Glenn, two yeah, minutes more. One minute. Okay. My final slide, again, uh, looking back at what was said here before in the past days, I heard, like I said, I heard a lot of variable uh, applications, real use cases, uh, people talking about how inspired data services were used uh, in the process or in the e-service of building permits, occupation of public space, excavation work, we have some examples, environmental par, uh, permits, e cadastres so a lot of use cases. Use case in the sense of providing real services to, benefit, uh, to citizens and sometimes also businesses. So you have some very good examples. A lot of these examples focus uh, on one uh, single member state or a particular part of a member state. Yesterday, one of the speakers uh, themselves raised the question, yeah, I'm now doing, uh, developing uh, some applications. The citizen in my region can do this and they can take advantage of inspired data and services, but I really have no idea on whether this is, uh, I expect that the same service should exist in other countries or in the, it should somehow, or citizens might require that uh, service or might benefit from that service, but I, I have no idea about it. Uh, so they were requesting on, yeah, what is now the status on providing those uh, location-enabled services uh, to citizens in different countries? And for me, I think that's a valuable extension of how we are thinking about monitoring the performance of SDI Inspire in different countries. So we now have a lot of uh, uh, correct, interesting information on the availability of uh, the data. I think the next step is that we should also try to have some additional uh, information on the availability of location, uh, yeah, location enabled e government services that are really making the link with how uh, businesses and citizens might benefit from all our work we are doing in implementing Inspire. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Well, the, finally, the last presentation, and sorry for the delay, Pierre Giorgio, for all, all of us. The, next, the last presentation is regarding the integration of the spatial information and statistic for the UN perspective and also in also to support INSPIRE directive. Pierre Giorgio Zakedu is also the person in charge for the group B inside of the UNGGIM Europe. Thank you. From Germany. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for this introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my presentation, uh, with my presentation, I will uh, come back to UNGGIM, UNGGIM Europe, <coughs> or hook back to GGIM Europe, as you said. And it's about how Inspire can support or how Inspire can be used for the better integration of geospatial information, and particularly uh, for the SDG monitoring. Um, I, will, I will try to say a few words on um, the situation of the uh, connection of the geospatial and statistical community. I will say a few more words on the SDG indicators through a geographic location lens. 
Um, and mainly I will focus on um, the contribution of our working group uh, on data integration from UNGGM Europe to support the global UNSDG monitoring. I would like to start with this slide because this shows um, somehow the, the view on the data and on the services of the different uh, communities, on the geo community on the right side and the statistical community on the, on the left side. The geo community I'm quite uh, familiar with. Uh, we talk about spatial data infrastructure, we discuss quality license issues and we provide our information, might it be reference information or thematic uh, information um, um, on a layer-oriented uh, level. So you have administrative units, addresses, um, land and properties, and so on. And this reference data is used um, by the statistical community to produce and provide socio-economic data. So key statistics, uh, census, tax information, information on immigration. So they used the reference data provided through a spatial data infrastructure. Uh, and therefore, the connection between these um, communities is important. And in Europe, um, these bridges between the community statistics and geo um, are established. And in some countries, they are very strong. And in others, uh, they could be better. And this is exactly one of the main objectives of UNGGIM on a global level, but particularly uh, of UNGGIM Europe uh, for a regional level. Yes, at Inspire, when in Inspire pops up with data sets and services, this will also have an impact on the workflows uh, from the statistical offices, in the statistical offices, because they, they have to uh, get familiar with different formats and services uh, providing the information. What is the main driver of uh, the connection of geospatial and statistical communities? And this is uh, exactly the, the round of census. The next one uh, will be prepared for 2021. And the Statistical Commission at the United Nations um, stated that the census can be a, a catalyst for the statistical and uh, mapping agencies to, to complete integration of data for the statistical and the geospatial uh, data. And the round of censuses is an opportunity to address issues like collect statistical and geospatial information at the same time, collect and geocode uh, on different um, capture levels of geography, and to support a global statistical and geospatial framework which is to be um, um, developed uh, by the statistical community but also involving the geospatial community at the moment. Okay, in, in the second presentation, Dominique presented already um, the, the current status of the work of the, the work group on core data. I will not focus my presentation, as I said, on the uh, the tasks and, and outcome and findings the work group B has already achieved. Rather than I will focus uh, my presentation on the follow-up work plan for the next years to come as a European contribution um, to the global process of the SDG indicator framework because that is exactly what our working group is supposed to contribute to, to the uh, SDG monitoring on a global level from a European perspective. A few more words on the indicators. I will keep this short because Dominique and the others already mentioned that. Uh, you have got 17 goals. Um, there are already um, analysis on uh, the geospatial dimension um, of the, the goals and the targets. This is one of Eurostat. And Eurostat stated that at least one third of the goals and the targets have a geospatial dimension. From a um, geospatial community point of view, I would say that each of the goals and each of the targets has got a ge geospatial dimension. So we are at 100%. Uh, maybe the indicator measurement, that is exactly what has to be identified now. Uh, for which indicator you need geospatial information for its measurement. But that's a different point of view. 
Okay, you've got 169 targets. At least there is one uh, indicator per target. There are global indicators uh, to be measured by all member states. There are additional, additionally regional and national indicators, and um, the indicator man, uh, measurement um, shall be done predominantly uh, by using official data. These are examples for indicators um, which, which have a clearly, not only a geospatial dimension, but where the, the, the indicator measurement, the calculation of the indicator needs geospatial information. Several examples, and one example is indicator 661 uh, for gold six, change in the extent of water-related ecosystems over time. This is, I think, quite uh, obvious that you need geospatial data, not only for the analysis, but also for the indicator measurement. Okay, but concerning the monitoring and reporting for this uh, SDG framework, which is quite new and uh, is to be established now, um, there are possible conflicts of interest. For example, there might be a competition of different actors concerning the definition of methods, concerning the uh, coordination level. There might be a competition of different analysis levels as well. So the national one is quite clear. Each member state have to um, set up a framework to provide a report to the United Nations. But is there a need for a regional analysis as well, or is there a need for a global analysis? There might be a competition of available geospatial data. Here, remote sensing data might provide different or new methods for the, for the analysis. Uh, or is in situ data the data you, you have to use for the, for the analysis. There might be a competition as well on different analysis methods for different resolution levels. And what becomes clear to me is that um, information exchange and coordination is needed because there are many players uh, at the moment who are addressing these issues and who are doing things and uh, information exchange and coordination is needed here on a national level as well as on the European level. And we can learn, um, of course, from INSPIRE, uh, because INSPIRE is a very strong um, framework and the implementation is ongoing, so even for the um, monitoring and reporting for the SDGs, INSPIRE um, can provide information and con can provide, uh, um, yes, the, 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 the a framework or um, an example for a good framework. So there are still some questions to be answered at the moment, um, nationally uh, particularly. So who is in charge uh, in the member states to consolidate the information for the SDG monitoring? Because as I said, this is mainly, or the SDG monitoring addresses mainly the, the member states. So who is in charge nationally to do this? Which ministry is, um, is in charge for the coordination? Which national uh, organization collects and submits the reports to the UN? Uh, to the UN and who validates uh, the information? Which role are the NMCAs, the National Mapping and Cadastral Agencies, playing in this framework, as well as the national statistical offices? These are questions not resolved and not answered in all countries. What is clear is that uh, if we talk about regional analysis for Europe, of course, the INSPIRE and uh, Copernicus also data and services um, uh, will be used for the European analysis and reports. But as I said, the roles and tasks for the national mapping agencies and uh, for the statistical offices has to be, um, have to be determined. Okay, how will uh, the working group on data integration of UNGGM Europe um, contribute and try to support this global monitoring. If you look at uh, the UN structure at the moment, uh, you have two global groups uh, working on, uh, on the SDG monitoring. The first one is the so-called interagency and expert group on sustainable development goal indicators. This is the group who provided uh, the proposal for the global indicator framework. So the indicators uh, I showed before and the other colleagues showed um, before 
this has been um, created by this uh, first global group. And then since um, August, I think, there is a new group uh, that um, has been established, um, clearly um, understanding uh, the role uh, of geospatial information uh, contributing to this indicator framework. And this is the a work group, a sub-working group of this global group on geographic information. And from the European regional perspective, um, the work group on data integration will contribute to this global groups and um, will ensure uh, a two-way interaction with this global group. And uh, from the regional perspective, some members of the work group data integration are also members um, of this global work group on geographic information, including myself. Before this global group on um, geographic information uh, was established, um, there was a task team uh, of UNGGIM led by Denmark. And for this task team, um, the INSPIRE framework was already used for a first analysis. You can see here that for um, I hope you can see that, that for different uh, targets and different indicators, the INSPIRE themes were analyzed and it, it was um, uh, elaborated um, which data sets uh, and themes can support the indicator measurement. So the INSPIRE framework was used here by the European uh, members of the task team. Okay, as I said, the, this global group on geo-information um, established in, in August this year. Um, several tasks have been assigned to this global group and I will not go into detail um, uh, for this task, but you can, uh, ho I hope that you can see that for this year and for the, for the next year, mainly a review and an identification of the indicator framework, the, the, the classification, the data gaps, so which data gaps exist and which data gaps have to be addressed and which issues have to be addressed. That is uh, a work that uh, has to be done this year and next year by this global group. And the European work group on data integration will support this and will uh, contribute to this. Then beyond 2017, um, strategies uh, will have to be proposed um, for method methodological uh, work, as well as um, the role of the statistical offices, the national statistical office offices, um, will be um, yeah, discussed and, and guidance provided. For the work group on data integration, um, at least two specific tasks um, are discussed at the moment, and next week there will be the, the plenary session of UNGGM Europe in, in Budapest, and I hope that these support and these two tasks will be approved by the plenary next week, so that uh, apart from the support of the global group, um, the work group on data integration will also develop practical examples on specific national implementations as well as suggest better links and better interaction between different communities. Likewise, the statistical and the geospatial community. Okay, how can INSPIRE support, uh, support um, or be used? Um, this is a summary slide. As I mentioned in one of my slides, uh, the availability of spatial data sets and services um, from INSPIRE will change somehow the methods and the workflows for data integration and interaction of the communities. Um, the INSPIRE framework will be used for the, um, for the implementation and also for the setup of the national, regional and global SDG indicator framework. And it is almost clear that for European analysis, SDG analysis, INSPIRE and Copernicus spatial data and services will be used. Okay, this was my last slide. Thank you very much um, for your attention and for sharing your time with me at this late time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Pier Giorgio. I would like to summarize uh, in the, the all different presentations of today in this session. 
we are review and present the organization and also the last uh, work carried out inside the UNGJM global and special detail, with special detail to the UNGJM Europe with the group A and B, A for core uh, data set and B integration. Also, we are review the importance of the addresses with the sustainable development goals. And finally, we are review the open spatial data policies and insights of SPY. And now, I would like to give the floor in order to have any question for a different speaker. Yes, please, if it's possible, identify first and the, peop and the person that you dedicate your question, please. Yes. Ray Boguslavsky from uh, the European uh, Commission Joint Research Center. Uh, it's a, a, a general observation first and then a, a question for Dominique. Uh, so the general observation is a thanks to everyone for uh, 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 introducing and tackling some important actions on, uh, on really important connections in the, in the geospatial world, uh, on core data, and on addressing in particular, uh, and on um, the links with uh, statistics and uh, supporting um, sustainable development goals. I wanted to uh, point out, uh, in parallel with this UNGGIM work, the European Commission, through its Interoperability Solutions for Public Administrations program, is investigating similar topics from an e-government perspective. And uh, you've uh, introduced uh, one uh, particular uh, view in terms of sustainable development goals. There are other view views that, that overlap uh, on, uh, on, on related topics such as e-government, such as the digital single market and important European Commission policies. Uh, all these activities need to, uh, need to fit together. Uh, in particular, there are investigations currently into what may be done uh, to promote uh, better sharing of uh, geonames and address data uh, across Europe. So some connections uh, need, to be, need to be made, and uh, we will make the connections uh, following, following this meeting. For Dominique, uh, the, uh, uh, the presentation, the very good presentation, you introduced your steps of Firstly, identifying the themes, and secondly, preparing the data specifications on uh, some of the areas that are currently being investigated, as I said, in this parallel activity, at uh, GeoNames uh, addresses, uh, very important. What happens next once you've developed those data specifications? Uh, what will you do next? Uh, I think our work plan also includes uh, steps about uh, uh, envisaging uh, production process, uh, business model, and these kind of things. Uh, I don't know it by art, but uh, the work plan doesn't stop by end of uh, 2017. The, the practical things about how to implement it uh, will be considered in, uh, after two, during 2017 and after. Yes, uh, uh, please. Mario Caetano from Portugal, please. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Uh, sorry. 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 Uh, yes. A question to, to Bruce. Uh, it's very interesting because I, 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 I am working for, for one month about the, the idea of address. I have a talk with Ray just before. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I'm thinking that effectively a physical building on property addresses are just a fraction of the of the solution that we have to think to of the thing you have in uh, in Ireland uh, open post code I believe that seems to be to be good and my question is uh, why do you uh, mix uh, to to deliver to 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 place and, and so on with tracking because for my understanding it's very different to have a a fixed place in the world to go to a fixed place and so on to uh, on the other side uh, to, to to follow uh, an object through IOT for example so uh, could, could you explain why tracking is in your at the same level as the other place thank you 
Last year, I was at a big data value association conference um, in Lisbon. No, no, sorry, Madrid. And um, one of the things that really struck me was the shift from what we've all been used to in a kind of GI environment, which is using effectively static historical data to real-time mobile. And it absolutely struck me that this is where the new space is in which we need to start thinking. And <clears throat> addressing is a, one of, thinking about it in that broad conceptual sense, addressing is obviously one of the ways in which you can track things that are moving in real time through space. And it's within that context that I was thinking of that tracking and moving and so on, using the addressing is actually a very important thing. I mean, an address could be a, a cow. A cow could have an address. You know, I mean, we tend to think of houses and businesses and so on. A bird could have an address, a car. And in fact, mentioning cars, driverless cars, that's going to be a major area um, for addressing, for us to conceptualize and think through all the issues around addressing, um, for moving objects, cars. It doesn't have to be cars, it could be any of these other things I've been talking about. And increasingly, you know, with the um, RFID tags being able to be so small, um, one can be linking to, I don't know, well, maybe this is an extreme, this pen. Um, and addressing would be moving not just outside in space, but inside buildings as well. You know, that's another whole area of moving, addressing, tagging systems. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but okay. Thank you. Please, Mario. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank for all the people that are involved in these working groups. I think you are doing a fantastic job and it's, uh, I know that it takes your time. You are not, I don't think you are paid for that, so um, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for, uh, for Dominique. Um, when you present these core data set uh, uh, specifications and so on, I'm a little bit uh, confused and maybe you can clarify me. Um, so Inspire already defines technical specifications for, for the themes but you, are, you said that you are going to develop data specifications. So what are the differences? So if you already have data specifications for Inspire, why are we developing new ones? And my second question was, is, um, um, but don't take me wrong, it's just to clarify me these, uh, these issues. My second question is, um, and uh, I know that Eurogeographics have been developing some products like the Euro regional maps where we already some, we have, we have already some layers of information. Uh, in addition to that, we have the ELF project. Uh, I'm from the Portuguese uh, National Mapping Agency, so uh, we are involved on that. Uh, we are in the ELF project. We are um, creating new layers for Europe. Uh, so what is the difference between all these and the work that you want to carry out now? Thank you. I have tried to explain it in the presentation. Uh, Inspire is about harmonizing existing data. But doing this, we, we harmonize the structure, but not the content. Uh, as I explained in Inspire, almost everything is voidable. If you have it, you have to provide it. But if not, there is no obligation of production. So the idea is really to, to go to common content not only to common structure, but to common data content. Regarding health, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I think the, uh, the content of, uh, you, for instance, Euro regional map, it may be a good starting point to define this core content. For instance, the mandatory attributes and feature types of Euro regional map, they may be a good starting point uh, for transport network, for hydrography, because they are the result of long discussion with uh, Eurostat and Eurostat representing uh, all the DGs of uh, European Commission representing uh, a long history of user requirement survey in a way. Thank you. Uh, Mauro. I would like to answer, <laughs> to complain, to also to, com to complement this information from my point of view. 
it's crucial, your question, because from our point of view, I said for Spain and for many other countries, the geographic produce and also give the Euro regional map, but it is very a small scale. We are thinking in a very accuracy uh, data set, only five, six, seven different uh, core geospatial reference data maintains and very accuracy every year for all different countries, transportation network, hydrographic network, not the, the, the small scale, it's very big scale. Especially because in this moment for Copernicus, it's very important users in this moment at the European level produce or intend to produce this information and very high accuracy. This question, this question. For this reason, the second question for you is the specification. The specification is included, but in very, in, in very general model inside of a spy. But at this high level resolution on a, or accuracy, it is necess necessary to, to give more attributes, more uh, parameters in order to define and harmonize all the information in all Europe. For this reason, there are two questions. One is at a small scale, it exists in this moment inside of Eurogeographics and Eurostat, and we are thinking in the future, new production system in order to produce six, seven teams at very high accuracy and valid, this is the grand, a, a very great discussion, from the national, continental, and global. GRC. Banda. It's just to add, a, let's say, <coughs> a precision. We have been discussing a lot within the group, and uh, I think it, the terminology is leading to confusion in the sense that what Inspire has is data specifications, but not data product specification, meaning once based on a certain set of data specifications, you want to produce a data product, then you have to specify how to produce it, how to produce it, including what are the parameters, <coughs> what I'm saying, parameters of quality, uh, meaning what is the level of detail, as uh, Antonio said, at what scale, he's talking about large scale, meaning the, the quality uh, parameters we have to respect are much higher than if you are producing smaller scale. And all these type of specifications are part of my product specification. So I think to be precise, we should say that based on Inspire data specifications, we are now at the step of delivery data product specifications for core data sets that are of uh, use necessary for the special data goals. Mm -hmm. I think. Thank you, Wanda, for your clarification. Please, is it possible for you to identify your yeah. identification? Yeah, Roger Longhorn, Global SDI Association. We're starting to participate in the GGIM regional uh, groups. We've become members of the GGIM Americas, and I think one of our representatives at GGIM Europe next week in Budapest to hopefully be accepted there as well. My question is practical for Per Giorgio or someone else from the group. On the indicators, how much uh, technical documentation exists yet? We've got 169 indicators that are gonna be produced from around the world. Is there a specification on how you will collect the data and report those indicators, and is there any quality control on those indicators, on that information? Otherwise, the value of the indicators could be called into question yeah. uh, if, it's, if it's not really well specified. Thank you very much for that question, yeah. The answer is that the situation is very heterogeneous. This global group has defined this global indicator framework, and they have compiled somehow for each um, target and for each indicator um, a so-called metadata, so a, a documentation um, on how the indicator is understood and which data should be used to measure this indicator. But for certain targets, uh, this documentation has 50 to 100 pages, and for others, it's one page. So. Um, the situation is, is unclear for certain indicators, and as I said, um, this tier classification has also been, um, uh, been set by this global group. That means that tier one means there are certain indicators where the method is clear for the measurement, 
and the data which shall be used for the indicator measurement is clear. The second tier means that the method is clear, but the data is not so clear. And for the third tier, that means method not really clear and indicator, uh, so the data is unclear as well. Thank you, Pier Giorgio. Are there any other comments, questions? Well, you know, I would like to close this session. I would like to, to give all of you my personal idea. In this global scenario that we are uh, working in this moment, more than never, it is necessary to, to take in account, probably, think in global and act at local. Thank you very much for all.